briefly. I ask, Lord, that the uh, worship will be pleading to your ears as we meditate on the words and meditate on our relationship with you. I ask that you will watch over Zach as he gives us this message and that we will learn from the message what you will have us take away from it. In your name, amen. All right, and here's the worship team. Welcome, everybody. Let's stand, please, if you're able, and let's get into worshiping the Lord here. All right. That is better as one day in your courts. of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Most of you should know this old hymn, Rock of Ages, so here we go with this one. Sin, the double cure, 
Morning, church. Once again, welcome to Compass Fellowship. Just got a couple of announcements for you guys before we get started with the uh, more worship and the uh, message for today. Next slide. There we go. All right, remember to register and vote. The um, deadline for that is coming up on October 24th. So one of the most important dues we can do as American citizens. A lot of men and women have died for that freedom. So get a chance, please go out and make sure you register to vote by October 24th. And our life groups have been starting up. There's all the ones right there, Growing God's Grace, Apologetics, What's Next, Ladies Group, Men Group, Doing Life Together, and Family Driven Life. If you'd like to go to any of those, there's more information at cfpc.me slash lifegroups. All right, Monday nights, we have Awana at 6.30 to 8 p.m. here at the church and break free from 6 to 8 p.m. over at the Solid Rock Youth Center. Uh, this week, um, this coming Monday, so tomorrow, uh, Break Free will not be meeting. However, Awana is still meeting at the church here. So no Break Free, but there is still Awana. And we have a trunk or treat coming up in an outdoor movie on October 28th. So we care too, the Solid Rock Youth Center, the church, and the Mortville Police Department has been um, be working together to put together this uh, effort to have a trunk or treat. I believe it's going to be over in the gravel parking lot, and then an outdoor movie at Williamson Park at the stage. We'll be showing Coco, so come out to that. It'll be a good time. And there's a community cleanup coming up on October 15th, so meet at SYRYC, SRYC at 10 a.m., and as a thank you for all those who are going to help, there'll be food at 1 p.m. on me, so please come out and help me out clean the uh, community, and you get free food afterwards. Then prayer updates, just the ones we can usually pray for. But does anybody have any prayers or concerns we want to uh, lift before the Lord right now? All right. So you're scheduled for an abrasion on the 9th. That's, that's good. So I'll be praying for that. Anyone else? Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. So try the for you and Rich. believe it for two weeks. Got it. And yes. Awesome. All right. Yes. Thank you. We will definitely be praying for your sister. Yes. All right. Let's bow our heads and come before the Lord. Uh, Lord, I want to bring all these uh, praises to you and all these uh, concerns to you, Lord, and those prayers we've been praying for for months now as well. Uh, Father, you are good in all situations, and we ask that you watch over these situations with these medical situations, for traveling mercies, and Lord, for any prayers that have not been spoken, but you know in our hearts, we ask that you watch over and are sovereign over those situations as well. Lord, once again, be with us as we continue our worship, as we hear the lesson from Zach, and just ask the Lord that you will stir our hearts to to uh, learn what you have for us to learn from this message today. Amen. song here is going to be a peppy one. I'm turning my sorrows. <laughs> I was told this was one of Pastor Gary's favorite tunes when he was overseas.
always sound like it's Buddy, hey, can I have a hug? Oh, you gotta go to the nursery, okay? Thanks for the hug, okay? I gotta preach, okay? Can you go to the nursery? All right, say bye. All right, go with mama, okay? I know. Go with mama, please, okay? Go, go with mama, please. Yes. Good morning, Compass Fellowship. How are y'all doing this morning? That chill, it woke you up, right? It's great. Yeah, it's great. All right, so for those of you who have been following, we are in the book of James for our sermon series right now. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at James 1, 19 to 27. So I know you were all thumbing already to that section of your Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, you can feel free to grab one of the pew Bibles, follow along with us this morning. And the lovely Joey Wisner is going to come up and read that passage for us this morning. So Joe, if you want to come up, I got to take this off. I always, when I wear these jackets, it always bumps my mic and then I, you get all that weird bouncy noise or whatever. So just tell everyone I looked good for a few minutes. <laughs> Thanks. All right, Joey. We're reading James 1, 19 through 27. Oh, I need a mic for you. That would help. Can you be very bright when you start in the morning so you can stop worrying about like sleeping in the morning? All right. Because my voice sounds like this. No karaoke. <coughs> yes, it is. <sighs> it's on. Yeah, it's on. <laughs> This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at, at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he is. But one who looks intent, 
intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having be become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. If, if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the, in the sight of our God and Father is this, to, the, to visit orphans and widows in their distress to keep oneself unstained by the world. Thank you, Joey. You want to give Joey a hand? I don't know why you gave this to me. You need a second service. All right. So, Joey, I want you to keep this because you'll need a second service because you're helping me out then too. Don't forget. Don't leave me hanging. All right. So, to some degree, this morning, I actually feel uh, I need to kind of like give you a little piece of my heart here. I feel totally un... un not unprepared, but I feel like in some ways I'm the wrong guy for this because when I look at this passage, it's, it's many of you who are my friends here, you, you're like, Zach, you got to read this a couple times. And I think some of us probably, hopefully we, you can give me some grace when you hear me preach on this topic this morning because this is probably one of the things that God has been working on in me over the course of my life. It's probably one of the hardest things for me to wrestle with in the scripture is to bridle my tongue, right? Because sometimes, sometimes I just talk. And then sometimes afterwards I think about what I said and I'm like, did I really mean to say that? So we're going to talk about that this morning. But I wanted to confess that to you all this morning that, you know, hopefully you give me a little bit of grace here and, uh, as, I, as I talk about this this morning. So this morning, we'll be going through five parts of this passage, okay? So we're going to break it down in five ways. The first section is pacing and priorities, verses 19 to 20. Second section is soul surgery, verse 21. Then mirror, mirror, 20, 20, uh, 22 to 25. Bear your bridle, verse 26. And religion redefined, verse 27. But before we dig into that, um, I'd like to pray. So if you would... Pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that your word is effective and that it cuts right to our soul, Lord, that your word is effective in changing us and in making us more like your son. And I pray, Lord, that this morning, that uh, even as you have brought me up here to preach this word, Lord, that you would do that for me, as you also do that for our congregation, Lord, that this word, your word, would impact us, that each of us would take the part that is necessary for us to think on, for us to meditate on, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would help us to hear that word, Lord, receive it, and that it would sanctify us, Lord, and that it would make us more effective in fulfilling your mission here on earth. And I pray these things in your son's name. Amen. All right, so our passage starts out by pacing our priorities. Many of you have probably heard this passage before if you're, if you've, you know, kind of grown up around the church. This is a pretty um, standard passage, I think, especially when there's some sort of conflict between people. <laughs> this passage comes out as we talk about that conflict. Essentially, James says that believers must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, and that the anger of a man does not achieve the righteousness of God. To be quick to hear means to actually be an intentional listener. And in order to be quick to hear, you have to refrain from talking. I know it sounds so profound. In other words, to be slow to speak. And oftentimes I think when we don't listen well and when we, we speak too quickly, things get misconstrued and emotions rise. And eventually we can make a small thing become a much larger thing, a small miscommunication become a major conflict. And according to James, our anger 
does not make us any more righteous. Our anger does nothing to make us like Christ. And what James is doing in this passage is he's simplifying this problem of anger. So he's not just telling us just don't be angry. But what he's saying is that if we believe that being angry, that getting angry, that talking to people or dealing with people out of anger is not Christ-like, and if we believe that it does nothing to help us grow in our relationship with God, then, then don't focus on not being angry, because that's a big problem. Anyone hate it when you just get finished telling someone how you feel about something, and their advice to you is basically like, well, just don't feel that way. I, the women just looked at the, the men in their lives. It was like sudden. Was, they just, all of them. I got whiplash. My neck's actually been hurting. I think you just fixed it. Um, right, but that's a, that's a common thing that, you know, like when you're upset about something and, you, and they're just like, well, can't you just get over it? I mean, maybe not in that, that, those words, right? But that's how it feels sometimes. And we know that that doesn't really help us. It's not very practical advice, right? Because I don't know how to just not feel And I can't just make it go away. So the whole thing kind of gets messy when we try to deal with our emotions that way, where we just look at the big problem of, oh, this emotion, just make it go away. So James doesn't say just don't get angry, right? Because that wouldn't be helpful. James says, slow down. James says, focus on listening to others when they're speaking. James says, pay attention to when and how you reply to people. And if you do that, if you really focus on listening to others and holding yourself back from speaking over them or commanding the conversation, then you should actually see that your anger decreases. I knew a pastor once who was like, extremely quiet. And I'm, I'm from New Jersey, so we kind of talk relatively quickly, usually, just a little bit less than New Yorkers, like my wife. And so it was pretty frustrating for me. I mean, has anyone ever seen the movie Zootopia? I know this might be a couple, Hal is the only one that's seen this movie. Jamie's seen it, okay. So in this movie, Zootopia, it's, uh, you know, the, it, all the characters are animals, right? And at one point, uh, this bunny who's a, you know, police officer, she's trying to solve this case, and she's trying to get information. So she goes to the DMV, and she is talking to the person that works at the DMV. And can you guess what animal the DMV workers are? Sloths. <laughs> and so... She's trying to get this sloth to give her the information, and she's like, and, and it's very humorous. But it actually reminds me to some degree of this person, this pastor that I used to know when I was growing up, when I was a teenager. And one day I, I just asked him, I said, why do you talk the way that you do? And you know what he told me? He said, I like to listen to what you're saying. And then I like to think about what I want to say before I say it. And the teenage me was like, that's so profound. You want to listen to what I'm saying when we're having a conversation? And then you want to think before you respond? I've never thought about that before. <laughs> what a crazy idea. But this is not, I mean, it was not, it was new to me, but it was not a new idea. I mean, James, that's exactly what James is saying. And it's all over scripture. If you look at the Proverbs, it's repeated there, right? So we're going to look at a couple Proverbs. Proverbs 10, 19, it says, When there are many words, transgression is unavoidable, but he who restrains his lips is wise. 
Proverbs 13, 3, the one who guards his mouth preserves his life. The one who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. Proverbs 17, 28, even a fool when he keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is considered prudent. Proverbs 29, 20, do you see a man who is hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Yeah. So, those of you who know me, Jamie, Hal, some of you guys, Pete, <laughs> you can attest to the fact that this is, this is something that God is continually working on in me, right? Because sometimes I'll say stuff to you and you're like, hang on, did you think about what you said before you said that? And God regularly reminds me to slow down and to hold my tongue and to listen to others. And I promise you that five years ago, before any of you met me, I was much worse. And five years from now, my hope and my prayer is that God continues to make me much better at this with your help. So I've gotten better over the years, but I'm still a work in progress. And if you're like me today, this is a really healthy reminder for us. Whether it be in our conversations with our kids, or our spouses, or coworkers, or neighbors, and I got some neighbors, or our parents maybe, right? And there might be people in our life who we are actually more prone to anger toward, or to being careless with our words, to being quick to speak with, right? And actually, Rebecca and I talk about this all the time, I find that it's the people who we love that we are actually quicker to speak towards. So if it's any consolation, if I've said anything mean to you, it's because I really love you. <laughs> because we, we, like our guard is down with these people, but what happens is we're careless with our words. So try this next time you're talking with them. Focus on what they are saying. And you'll notice it's really hard to not think about what I want to say next. Right? Maybe it's just me. But when someone else is talking, I hear a little bit about what they say, and then my brain starts going, well, what am I going to say in response to that? And then what happens is I miss the second part of what they said because I wasn't listening. And so try this. Try taking the time to calm down before you speak. Joey and I, we talk about this all the time, right? Joey and I are brothers in this. Because <laughs> we got to take some deep breaths. We have to try to empath empathize with the other person that we're talking to. Hear them, feel what they're talking about, feel their emotion in that. And then sometimes it, it's worth asking clarifying questions before we even respond, right? Because sometimes we, get, we got it all wrong. And if we don't understand and we respond quickly, then we actually create this problem because there's this misunderstanding. So it's actually super helpful and really encouraging to other people when we ask a clarifying question in response rather than just advice, right? Because then they know that we really are trying to understand them. So if you're anything like me, you'll find that this method that James offers for reducing rage, super helpful. And when we're mindful this way, our relationships will be so much easier. It'll be easier to deal with our kids, it'll be easier to deal with our spouses and our friends and people that we don't always see eye to eye with. And so as we practice patience in our conversations and we reduce our rage, we'll be growing closer to God who designed us to be this loving. And as we pursue righteousness in this way, James moves on to what I call soul surgery in verse 21. Verse 21 says, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. So you've probably heard me say 
this before, but when there's a therefore, you have to ask yourself, what is a therefore therefore? So in this case, what it does is it pulls together the previous statement that James made and this statement about pursuing righteousness, or the, or the statement about pursuing righteousness with this new statement that James is making. And what he's trying to say is that anger is included in this all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness. So I want to point out that because he specifically mentions anger, that's a pretty bad thing to him. And then he kind of steps back to the more broad, and he says all filthiness, all wickedness, right? But the fact that he specifically targets anger, it's something that we should really, really think about because that's obviously pretty important to him because he's specifically calling that out, and then he goes to the broad, all wickedness. And what he's talking about in this process is called sanctification. And that's the process of becoming more like Christ. It's the process where we grow less sinful and more righteous. And these terms that James uses to describe sanctification, they sound, like I said, almost like soul surgery to me. James encourages the believer to remove wickedness and implant God's word, which he says is able to save the soul. So it sounds kind of like surgery, right? You're, you're taking something out, removing the bad, and you're replacing it with good. If Stephen was here, I'd call him out, because they just did that, right? They cut his heart open. They took away the bad. They fixed it with good. The other way that this word implant can actually be translated is engraft. Does anyone know what that means? So if you're a gardener, you might know this. If you've ever seen hybrid plants... Hybrid plants are made because they graft together two different kinds of plants. So what they do is they cut away part of one plant. I've actually seen where they'll, they'll take a, you know, a small seedling, sapling, tree, and they'll cut it at the base. And then they'll do that with another kind of tree. They'll cut that at the base, and they'll swap them, and they graft them together. And then the tree will actually take on the new tree, and it becomes an entirely new plant. It's not just the one or the other anymore. It's entirely new. It's a hybrid. And that's kind of what it sounds like James is talking about here. You cut away the parts that are ungodly, and then you graft in the word of God, and what we'll find is a new, better version of you. So maybe for you it's not anger or harsh words that you need to cut away in your life, but it's something else. Whatever sin that you're struggling with, maybe it's gossip or slander or malice or idolatry, whatever it is, James's advice is to slow down and to precisely cut away at that in your life. Cut away the sin in your life and replace it with God's word. And I think it's worth pointing out that James specifically emphasizes the need to be humble in this process. I want to take a minute to talk about humility. It's easier for us to read the word or listen to a sermon and hear things that pertain to other people. Anyone sit and sometimes you're like, oh, you know, I wish so-and-so were here because it's really... You know what I'm talking about? This is really good stuff for them. But when we approach the Bible or a sermon or our time in life group, what really what we are called to be doing is we're called to humbly seek areas in which we need to grow. And that's completely, it's a completely contrary worldview to the common worldview that says, well, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. You know, like I'm doing, doing pretty good. I mean, sometimes, sometimes I do this or that, but for the most part, 
I'm a pretty good person. And that's what, as soon as we step out these doors, that is exactly what the world tells us is, is fine, that we should strive for. But what, what James says is that constantly, until Christ comes back, we are meant to be cutting out the dead, the sin in our life, and grafting in God's word to make us a better version of ourselves. And by having a relationship with Christ, we now obtain a freedom to pursue righteousness in this way. This is a freedom that we actually could never pursue without our relationship with Christ. Prior to having a relationship with Christ, we didn't have this freedom to cut away sin in our life and graft in God's word. So with this newfound freedom, we hold the balance between the joy that we are completely forgiven and the recognition that we will always have areas that need sanctification until Christ returns. And in order for us to be sanctified, we have to humbly approach God, his word, and fellow believers seeking to find these areas of weakness, these areas that need cutting away, and seeking support, and seeking to support each other as we strive toward righteousness in these areas. I think it's also really important to emphasize the role of the Holy Spirit in this process. James doesn't talk a whole lot about the Spirit, but if you look at Romans 8.13, it says, For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So hopefully you hear in that verse, and there's plenty of other verses, but you hear in that verse that it's the same process, but the Spirit is heavily involved in this process. So some of our humility should be directed at God, at the Spirit, as we approach God's Word that we should be praying and asking the Spirit to direct our sanctification. That we would be open to hearing and seeing the Spirit move as he makes these areas of weakness visible to us. James goes on to explain this process further using an illustration of looking in a mirror. So that's the section, mirror, mirror, verses 22 to 25. It says, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become for, a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. So James says, be doers of the word, not merely hearers of the word. And the process is to take the word as it pertains to the wickedness or sin that you struggle with that keeps you from this righteousness of Christ. You take that word of God and you consume it. You don't just read it and ignore it, but you read it and you practice it. And you actually let it take hold of you and redefine exactly who you are. And the example James gives of the alternative is for a man to look in the mirror and walk away and immediately forget what you look like. And I kind of, ever since having kids, I like understand this example way more. Because there are days where I get someplace, like I'll walk into a building and I'll walk by a mirror and I'll look over and I'll be like, did I look in the mirror at all this morning? I'm pretty sure I did but I look ratchet. I don't, I look pretty bad. I'm fairly certain when I got up this morning, I brushed my teeth and there was a mirror right in front of me. And this has happened actually a few times for me to the point where now I actually like specifically make a point to look in the mirror when I wake up in the morning and be like, and just study <laughs> what I look like, to make sure that I don't get somewhere and find out that, like, I have a big blemish on my nose or 
my hair is all over the place or my shirt's hanging out or something like that, right? Similarly, we sometimes read God's word and we go to church and we don't look intently enough at God's word or reflect about ourselves enough to actually see this blatant blemish on our face. Now, James doesn't specifically talk about this, but I have found that there are times where I'm missing it. Like, I don't see this blemish on my face, but my wife or a friend who's generous enough to point it out to me will come along and help me with that, right? This might be too much information for some of you. It might gross you out, but my wife is, um, she's a pimple popper. I don't know if anyone knows those people. Um, and they're like relentless. They don't ask permission or anything. All of a sudden, it, like you go from like a gentle like this to, what did you just do? <laughs> so sometimes the way this works, it might pinch a little. Sometimes you might want it to be gentler than it is, but regardless of how gentle or maybe not so gentle this relationship <laughs> works between ourself and our brothers and sisters in Christ who hold us accountable for things, right? That is part of the sanctification process. And so even after that happens, right, you have to take a step back and go, as much as that hurt, I'm really glad that I'm not going to keep walking around with this pimple on my nose, right? I'm thankful that you helped me see that this is happening. And sometimes it's hard, right? But that is ultimately what helps us grow. Now, James says that if we are a doer of the word rather than just a hearer of the word, we'll be blessed in what we do. And I want to take a minute to talk about this because it can be confusing, this idea of being blessed. We will be blessed by our sanctification process as we move and act in obedience to the word. But I do want to be clear, this is not a health and wealth prosperity gospel. Like I said, there will be a pinch at times. Sometimes it's bigger than a pinch. Sometimes it's an ouch or, an, or a big boo-boo, right? When God is working to transform us. So sometimes when we are being obedient in this way, we actually should expect trials and testing as believers. And I'm not going to dig into that much more because Pastor Gary talked about it last week. So you can go, you can watch the YouTube, hear about it from him. But that is important to mention because the blessing is being sanctified. That is the blessing that you can expect from the process. The blessing is not that all of a sudden, you know, you might have health or wealth or a big house and a fast car, right? Our blessing comes as we become more and more obedient and more and more like Christ. Now, it seems that James thinks that our speech has a lot to do with our sanctification process. Because in the next verse, he goes back to that. He says in verse 26 that we have to bear our bridle. That's my terminology. I want to look at that together again. It says, If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. So James calls us to bear our bridle. How many of you know what a bridle is? All right, good. More people than Zootopia people. Got it. So a bridle is this, it's the part that goes in the horse's mouth there, right? And when I think about it, there's two things that can happen there if I'm, you know, putting myself in this horse's place. One, I think there's obviously going to be some restraint on my ability to speak, right? It's going to control or limit my speech in some way. So in this context, if we think of ourselves as a religious or 
present ourselves as religious. Maybe we've got some Christian bumper stickers on our car. Maybe we dress really nice and we go to church every Sunday. When we're at work with friends, though, we might gossip or slander or maybe we curse a lot or talk about crude or sinful things casually or humorously. What he's saying is that in doing that, you're deceiving your own heart and that your religion is worthless. So placing a bridle on the tongue would, I think, surely be a great way to restrain ourselves in our speech. I'm sure that we'd have a much harder time talking in general, let alone saying things that we really shouldn't be saying. So I think the point here is to practice restraint. But the second thing that I think is really helpful about this illustration is that the nature of a bridle is that it connects to the reins, right? Which the rider uses to direct the horse. And so I may be reading a little bit more into James's, what James is saying here, but I think it, it can be helpful for us to ask ourselves, who has the reins on our tongue? When we speak, who is guiding our speech? Is it the Holy Spirit? God through his word? Or is it the world? And ultimately Satan, the ruler of this world through the media that we consume and then we perpetuate? Or the friends that we keep? How many of you have heard the phrase, you are what you eat? Right? This phrase, I think, applies really well to our speech and our behaviors. Generally, I find that I don't struggle a whole lot with cursing or foul language, but on the infrequent occasions where I might struggle with cursing, there's, there's usually two things that influence that. At f the first thing is my prayer life and my devotion life. If I have not been spending time in the Word, if I have not been praying, then the things that come out of my mouth are often less wholesome than they should be. The second thing is the company that I'm keeping. I grew up in a public school. I have public school friends. They weren't Christians. I wasn't a Christian until later, until I was a teenager. Sometimes I still spend time with those people, and I find that it is much harder for me to control what I'm saying and not to say curse words or things like that because that's what they're saying. So when I spend a lot of time in that company, then you just start picking up language, right? Maybe it's not cursing for you, but that is something for me. I've got little kids, and I really want to be careful about what I say around them. It's pretty clear that when, when Christ has the reins on my tongue, then my speech and language changes. And I try to think of my speech as an opportunity to be a witness to those around me. So... Like when I'm walking around and I'm carrying something and I stub my toe and the first thing that comes out of my mouth is, gosh, instead of something else, right? I mean, I hang out with teenagers. Darn it. Golly gee willikers. Well, that turns heads. They're like, nobody says that anymore, you weirdo. Right? And it's kind of funny, but it does, they notice right? They notice. They hear my language, and they hear that it's more gentle or more positive. And one thing that I think it does is it makes me a person that they want to talk to, right? Because if they know that if they bring something to me, and I don't, I'm not going to fly off the handle, I'm not going to curse at them like their parents do, or their coaches, or their teachers, I'm not going to get in their face, I'm not going to lose it, I'm just going to sit and listen. They're much more likely to come and talk to me. And God is going to use that situation to cause them to wonder, what's different about Zach? It's going to lead to open doors down the road. That different language, that different behavior, paired with James's religion redefined, as I call it, in verse 27, makes our lives noticeably and recognizably different to those 
in the world. So I want to talk about that religion redefined. Verse 27, he says, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. We sometimes have to hold the tension between being in the world, reaching out to those who are in need, and at the same time, striving toward sanctification and not allowing the world to hold the reins on our life, but rather heeding to the Spirit's guidance and direction in our life. And in the culture at the time, orphans and widows would have been considered some of the lowest or most at-risk people in society. Some of you have heard me talk about orphans in the early church before. I've mentioned this before, so I won't exaggerate the point, but I do want to summarize what I've said in the past. At the time of the early church, it was so difficult and costly to raise kids. And not many people had the financial stability to have multiple kids. And at that time, in that culture, boys were valued over girls. And healthy kids were valued over disabled kids. And so for that reason, it was not uncommon for people to abandon their children, their newborn babies, in the town dung heap with the refuse and the feces discarded. And members of the early church would actually rescue those children and raise them as their own. And also at that time, women did not have a lot of rights, and they were not valued the same way that they are today. Women were more protected, and their situation was more stable if they were married. And if they were widowed, it would have placed them in a very unstable situation. Widows had little to no viable means to provide for themselves financially. And depending on their age, the likelihood of them being remarried could be really low. So that being said, women and orphans would have been considered some of the most at-risk and lowest people in society. And James is defining pure and undefiled religion as visiting orphans and widows in their distress and keeping oneself unstained from the world. That is how he's defining it. That is why they would wade into the dung heap to rescue babies. It's also why they concern themselves with caring for widows. In Acts 6, we see this played out in verse 1 to 3. It says, Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. So the church in Jerusalem was serving food to widows and had an issue arise where basically the native Hebrews were receiving preference over the Greek Hebrew or the Greek Jewish women, the widows. And so they, the apostles actually appoint individuals to oversee this process and make sure every widow was getting fair share. I mean, that's that's important. This is early on in the church. One of the first things that they do is make sure that the widows in the church were being cared for. For us in our modern context, it might, it might look differently, right? We don't have dung heaps anymore, and, you know, we don't have a whole lot of issues as far as Greek and native Hebrew women. But there are other things, Right? There's still a need to lift up and care for women in society and the rights of the unborn as well as the orphan. We can also see this carry over to those who are homeless. 
or those who are addicted to substances or the kid down the street that's being bullied, right? Or someone struggling with food insecurity or those who are impoverished. James equates our religion, our faithful following Christ to seeking out those individuals and helping them in their distress. I find that we might be more willing to help someone who brings a need to our attention, right? Maybe we're passing them by on the street and they ask for money or food and it tugs at our heart and we say, yeah, come in 7-Eleven with me, I'll buy you a coffee, right? We might be willing to help them in their distress, but James actually says to visit them in their distress, to go out and seek them out. Not just as it's casually convenient for us. And all the while, we are called to maintain our striving toward righteousness. There's this balance. The common phrase is to be in the world, but not of the world. We're called to seek out the lowly in their distress, and yet keep a bridle on our tongue and continue to give the reins of our life over to the Holy Spirit. And we have to be careful as we navigate our calling to seek the lowly out in the world that we, we're not letting the world influence us and stun our sanctification process, but we have to do both. And if you've ever taken any sort of course on lifeguarding, you might know that people in distress are dangerous because they oftentimes accidentally can pull the lifeguard underwater. And then you're both drowning. And similarly, when we go into the world as missionaries, as people following Christ where he leads us to rescue individuals in distress, we want to be on guard that we keep ourselves unstained by the world, that we are not pulled down by the very people that we are called to seek out in their distress. James addresses a few seemingly unrelated things in this passage, but I think the overarching theme is that believers are called to continually turn the reins of their life over to the Holy Spirit as we graft God's word into our lives and seek out the lowly in their distress while maintaining our sanctification. And if you couldn't remember all of that, it's on the page for you. You flip it over. And as we leave today, I want you to consider in what ways do you need to turn those reins over to the Holy Spirit? Maybe this morning you felt convicted for the first time in your life to turn the reins of your life over to Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to begin to transform you. I mean, there are people that maybe have walked through life holding on to those reins and still walked in and out of church their whole life and still, but they haven't given the reins over. And if that's you today, I would encourage you, just take some time and just pray to God and say, God, I want you to have the reins on my life. I want to fully experience the forgiveness that you have forgiven me with, and I want you to control and move me to sanctification. Maybe you realize today that you just need to slow down and think about what you say before you say it. Maybe you realize that you need to ask a brother or sister in Christ to hold you accountable for something, to be that mirror, <laughs> to look at you and find the blemishes and help you to deal with them. Maybe you're realizing that you haven't really been living your life out in faith and seeking out the low places and the people who are in distress. Wherever you are today, I would challenge you to continue to spend time in the Word because that is James's focal point. That is what you're grafting into your life. That is what will transform you, is God's Word. And humbly, prayerfully, ask the Holy Spirit to work on these areas of weakness and in humility ask for that accountability from a brother or sister in Christ let's do that together as we close in prayer Heavenly Father we we thank you for your word 
We thank you, though, that you also forgive us. And so even if we have heard this over and over and over again and we are reminded over and over and over again that we need to bridle our tongue, Lord, or we need to heed your word, that we need to let your word be grafted into our life, and maybe we haven't done that or we haven't been doing a good job lately, Lord. We thank you that you forgive us. We thank you that you make that possible for us to continue to strive towards. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to see those blemishes, that we would look in the mirror and we would see exactly who we are and where we stand with you, that we are forgiven, and yet there are these things that you want us to be working on, Lord. And I pray today, Lord, that as we leave, that you would make us more like Christ, that we would have a passion to seek out those in low places, but that we would also keep ourselves unstained from the world. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen.